I can see my slides, so I think I'll make a start while they prepare the background. Today we're going to be looking at digital well-being in school and at home. And the reason I pause at those two words is because even though our children are in school with us, like you said yesterday, between four to five hours, they spend a long, obviously, for a very long time at home as well. But when we're looking at a topic at digital integration, we're, to, we're talking about everything from smartphones, iPads, laptops, PCs, internet, and any electronic toy that connects into Wi-Fi. Now, how many of you here have a smartphone? Yes. How many of you have children who use a smartphone or iPad? I have three, so I can imagine you all having some as well. So when we look to integrate technology into our school environment, please don't be surprised to see that that same sort of stuff will also go back home, and whatever your children are doing at home will also come into the school environment. And we really want to be able to take care of our children, make sure they are happy, they're well, um, everything that they access is safe. But at the same time, the school environment we built for our children in school is also safe. It makes them happy, it keeps them motivated, and it keeps them engaged in their learning. So today, I've divided my topic into four bullet points, and I will take you through it one by one. The first one we're going to look at is developing a positive digital leadership culture in school. And I really need to make a, a point about this. It's not just about adding technology in lessons or in the curriculum, but it's spreading it across the culture in school. The next thing is meeting our students' digital literacy expectations. And when I talk about that, I'm actually referring to this book here in my hands. It's called Digital Literacy. But in here, we have a plan, and we tend to do this in most schools in the UK. The books that I have here is Innovation on a Budget. So not many schools around the world have lots and lots of resources and technology at their fingertips. This book is a step-by-step -step guide for schools and teachers to integrate technology more hands-on in the classroom. The other day I was looking at some ICT books in India and I found that they're very theoretical, which is so important. We need that even for exams. But if children are learning theory and not putting it into practice, it sort of defeats the purpose from a digital point of view. And this book here starts from reception all the way to year six with a few more to follow in year seven and eight. But they are step-by-step -step guides for teachers um, who can help with this in their classroom. The third thing is empowering our teachers to instruct in a digital space. So while it's important to bring the students on board and the school from a leadership and vision point of view, even our students are key. They are our futures. They are, this is their world. We have given them this digital world. We've grown up with it, but we, we're building it, but they're growing up with it. So we need to prepare them to make the right decisions, be able to use the technology as they see fit, safely, appropriately, and also be able to use it so that they're on par with their other students all around the world. And the very last point is bridging the digital parenting gap. And again, we'll refer to this book here called Digital Parenting, which really was created in mind to help educate parents who find it very difficult in this digital space. Not everybody gets technology, and we also find that there's a big widening gap between parents and students. So this little book here is like a coffee table book that you would put on a table here, and parents can pick it up and read it at any time. This has now been translated into Chinese and has gone into the Chinese community, because as you can imagine, there's a lot of tech in that place. So let's start now. Okay, developing a positive digital leadership culture in school. I tend to walk around, but we will speak from here. If there is a, a movable mic, that will help. If not, I'll continue. So when we develop a, a digital leadership culture in school, it doesn't just start with teachers and students, although that is the crux of the whole solution, the pedagogy, the teaching, and the learning. But before you do that, it is so important for the senior management team, for the principal, for the heads, to understand what are you doing with this technology? Why are you bringing it into your school? So what I've done, thank you, hello, okay. So what I've done is we've created a unit, um, an online course, and that's what you see there. 
often people ask me, so what are the um, objectives? What do I need to look at in order to bring digital strategy into school? And the very first one is digital leadership. And by that I mean a vision. If your school doesn't have a vision for digital leadership, it's going to be very difficult to implement this across the school. So it could be anything from, a, a vision could be as simple as, I want to enhance teaching and learning in my school using technology. Or I want to be able to meet um, really significant and valuable feedback from my students using the technology. Or I want to be able to produce more flipped learning environments where the, the students are learning at any time, anywhere, any place. But that vision needs to be put into place. And once you have that vision, then you need to have a one-sentence vision so that everybody is singing from the same hymn book. And by the way, that's what Mike told me. So just so you know, if you can give, put it in one sentence and get everyone to say it, or, you know, each and every person to be able to give that vision uh, whenever you speak to them, then you know your, your journey has started. So what is your vision? Ask yourselves that. Is your vision um, just to, to compete with the school next door? Is your vision just to introduce digital literacy into the curriculum? Um, is, it, is it a vision that's only for the school or for only the senior team? Or does it also include the teacher's feedback, what they think the vision should be? Your vision should be part and parcel of everyone's thought processes. Student voice is also really important. So I would say start from the top, come up with the vision, but filter it down, make sure that everyone also agrees with it. So like I said, some of them might mean, I want to meet 21st digital skills, um, or other, other, all the other schools must be doing it, so we must be doing it right. To me, the most important thing for any digital vision is we need to prepare our students for the world they're going into. And, and education has changed. We're no longer just sitting in rote like fashion and absorbing facts and data. We don't have to. The computers do it. Many, many um, of our statements now include uh, the information like, do we really need to know how to type, for instance? Do we really need to know our mathematics so entrenched within our systems? And there's some truth to that. But the truth is, if a robot can do it for you, then you're going to have to find another skill. Because those are the skills that AI and robots are going to bring in now. And we have to enrich our children with the softer skills that I've heard here all of you speak about since yesterday. You know, empathy, mindfulness, happiness, being able to reflect, analyze. Those are the things that we need to get our children to think about. So de developing the school strategy or the digital strategy doesn't just fall down to um, a whole number of teachers. One thing we've learned over time is find one person in your school who's ready to be accountable for this. Of course, all the teachers need to get involved. But if you can find one person in your school who's going to say, I'm going to lead the digital ed tech, that will really help your school. Um, and that person doesn't have to be a technical guru or somebody who gets infrastructures and servers and gadgets. That will help. That's your IT team. This person needs to understand teaching and learning, needs to understand how the teachers are teaching now, what tools will help um, when they go into the classroom, what do the students want. That's what I've heard a lot since yesterday. What we want and what the student want are not necessarily the same thing. So it's so important that the person who helps lead this vision into your school understands it from all points of view. Don't forget the parents, they are also very key. So the digital leader will need to understand the needs of the students, they'll need to understand the needs of the teachers, and they need to understand the parenting community. What comes next after all of that is being able to implement it into your school and provide a very strong CPD training program. That is key. Teachers need a lot of training, and it's okay to say you don't know. Many of our teachers don't know, and in fact the students knew first. So we, get, we give the teachers the flexibility to ask the students, can you please help me? For instance, my display panel, my interactive whiteboard is not working. Why is it not working? Can you show me? Or, you know, we want to use this uh, really important, uh, this flexible interactive toolkit in our classroom, but I've forgotten how to start it. Can you please show me how? So we give permission to teachers to ask these questions and not feel bad about it. 
and that's really key. While changing the curriculum and changing your mindset, we almost need to understand that we may not have all the answers in today's digital age, and it's okay, because you've still got the subject wisdom, but they have the technical ability, and so it's okay to exchange information now. So really, the reason you're bringing digital ed tech integration into school is because you want to be able students to give students an environment where they can motivate themselves and, and in, continue their own learn, learning independent journeys. Yesterday, in um, one of the roundtable discussions here, I was really impressed by, um, I can't remember his name, a speaker. And he mentioned that when he, sorry? Mispa. Yes, I think it's that. And he found that he had, bring in, he had brought informalized learning into his into school. And what he mentioned, he said one sentence that really struck me. Learning was chaos, but it was happening. And that's a little bit like digital technology. Initially, it's chaos, but it's happening. There's learning happening for teachers, for students, for parents, for school. But it's really happening for the students because you're not telling them what to do. They're going to do it themselves. And so it's a bit chaotic. Um, the learning outcomes are there, the objectives are there, but what they produce in the end is the beauty. And that's what I'll take you through in a minute. So from, the, from a very bigger, higher aspect side of things, before you even start digitally integrating tools into your curriculum or into your school, just think about what are you doing? Why are you doing it? How is it going to make a difference? What impact is it going to have in my school? Financially, will it help things out? Get that vision statement in place and a framework of how you want to see it rolling out in the next year, two, potentially three years. And nothing follows plan, especially in the digital world. It's always inventing and reinventing itself. So if you have a plan, it doesn't matter if it's not linear, but at least you've got a framework to work with. So the next thing then is, okay, let's look at our students. We've, we've looked at it from a higher point of view. We don't want our students just to be consumers. There came a time when our children played with apps constantly, and it may still be the case. There is actually a lot of noise about this in the UK that there may, our children have too much screen time. And how much screen time is appropriate, for instance? I'll come to that in a minute. But looking at it from an educational point of view, how many of you have children who use the iPad for games? Me, I'm one of them as well. Um, and how many of you would say you would like your children to use technology more from an educational point of view, less consumerism, more productivity? Yeah, that's me too. So this is something that came aboard a couple of years ago, and we realized that our children were not producing, they weren't understanding why they were using the technology or how, could, how they could use it to extend their learning and create, but they were just consuming and consuming. And from that point of view, that's when we got really worried. You know, we want our students to be able to understand that the technology they use every day is really crucial and is where they're moving forward to. And for that, we need to build their building blocks. So with that in mind, we created um, this book. It's called the Digital Literacy Books. In the UK, we have a curriculum which is called the Computing Curriculum. The focus of the computing curriculum was very much around programming. And I know many of us are programmers here. I started out in that field too. So, and, and programming is the essence, the syntax of any computer. So I understand that too. However, not everybody is going to be a programmer. And we found that young girls, or girls in particular, don't tend to move towards programming. Although to be fair, I think in India we have a lot of female programmers. So who knows? But we also found that uh, technology is not just programming. There are other irrelevant areas of creativity, communication, collaboration, online safety that we need to teach our children. And if we are not teaching them all this, then we're failing them as educators because we are, they are in this space, they are using it in school and at home, and we need to prepare them for this. Just as you would prepare them for doing maths in school or English to take it home and outwards and onwards, we need to do the same with our digital technology. So these books came into place. It's called Digital Literacy. And as you can see, um, I've only got from reception to year six here. I have the books if you want to have a look at later. Dr. Sunita knows about this. She's also very interested in implementing that to make them more hands-on. 
But there's, you can see that there's an evolutionary growth here. So there's a whole section on communication and collaboration. There's a whole section on um, computational thinking and programming. And there's a section on computer networks and productivity. Now this is just a foundational base of an ICT program in school. This does not mean you have to stop here. Some schools can take this further. I've seen some schools implement this whole strategy, this whole curriculum, and then take it further into maker spaces and STEM environments where you bring science and technology and engineering and maths, and then you'd make really, you, you produce solutions to real life problems. But for those schools that don't have budget, for those schools that don't have many resources, I've often said, refer to these books first because you will start the journey, you will start the ball rolling, and it's really important for the students. The beauty of this program is that there are, um, there's about eight lessons in each section. So let's just say there's about 24 on average, and it's teacher-led. That means teachers can read it, and they can teach it. But again, like I said, the beauty is the students will run with it because this is their playground. They know what they're doing. You can be there as a facilitator, you can help them, you can support them, but in the end, they will do it because this is what they do. So just to take you very quickly through the program, the first one is about coding in the beginning. We start our children from age three years to start coding. And when we say coding, we talk about computational thinking and logical thinking. I was speaking to a delegate here yesterday, and she mentioned to me that we, she wanted to get different ideas about how children are using this. So at the age of three years, they're not going to be thinking programs and syntax and semantics or HTML or C++. They're going to be thinking precise directional language. Go left, go right, walk straight ahead. So we use it in a really playful manner. Again, we don't necessarily make the children sit in the classroom. We bring them out of the classroom. We introduce walkie-talkies. Walkie we'll get a group of students to give really precise information to children outside to get to a final outcome. So in the book, you'll see we have, um, in, uh, we have a, uh, um, a table of contents in which you have them looking at understanding and looking at logical thinking. We also have free apps. My, my basis around all of this is you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can use a lot of the apps that are available online and in our app store to get our children to going with this. Now everybody has a smartphone, so if you don't do it in school, you can tell your parents to take it at home. You can send a letter out saying, you might want to download the Beebot app because it's free and you can get your child to continue this sort of thinking at home. As they, so imagine this starts at the age of three years. As you move forward, the children get a lot more smarter. So again, speaking to the delegate yesterday, she was saying she wanted the children to go more hands-on in the classroom. So you Scratch Junior. Um, the Scratch Junior and the Scratch. Scratch Junior is for younger children. Scratch is for older children. It's a free web package online. You can Google it now, scratch.com. You can create a free username and password. And then you can start creating a community of games. So in this level, we get children to start programming and building their own games that they can share in a community. We found that we would start the journey in class, but they would take it home. And then I'd have parents come to me and say, did you know my son has won his award in this game because he's, bu he's built this brilliant ping pong game? I'll show you that in a minute. Oh, I don't think I can today, but I'll show you the link. You can go to it. And he won on the Scratch community. Now to him, that was amazing, but he learned it in school and he took it home. And that is the complete digital strategy you're looking for. Something you can take back home and something parents can see and come back to you and say, you're preparing my children for the future. As we continue there, it gets a little bit harder as they move um, into the older years. And then they do computational thinking and outputs. We get them involved in maker spaces. We get them involved in doing DIY, hands-on work. I believe there's a big... Um, I think it's really important to look at uh, maker spaces and electronics. So while the children are working in uh, programming and computational, get them to go hands-on. I often have this saying that says, brains on, hands-on, then brains on. The minute you're engrossed in something, it's so difficult to step out of it. So with that comes this whole conversation about screen time. You know, how much screen time is appropriate, for instance? If you're involved in creating an iMovie, how can you do it in half an hour? I've spent five hours on a plane one day creating a movie for my dad. 
it, I couldn't stop because there was so much to do. So again, there's that conversation of, a conversation of it's five hours of um, watching Dora the Explorer and T on the iPad, okay, versus five hours of doing an iMovie. You have to think about it. So if it's productive, then maybe you have to, we, have, we have to have these conversations. So that is that whole computational side of um, column in the book that we put forward. And I must tell you, most of the resources are free. Some of them are unplugged. You don't always have to plug your child to a computer. And that's really important too. They need to know computational thinking. Uh, they need to understand it without having to refer to the computer. They need to understand what it means. Okay, so this is the game that one of our students created. Unfortunately, I can't play it now. It's a link. Um, so it's, it's not connected in here. But the child in here has actually written out all the script and all the coding. So he's playing against the computer. And as he's playing and he wins, he gets a score. And then at the end it says game over. But there's so many games like this in the Scratch community. And once the children start learning how to do simple basic programming, they can do this themselves. I promise you, you'll get your schools to play with each other. But you've got to make that leap. You've got to start it. Okay, so this is another one called um, Hour of Code. Again, it's a free resource. It's online. It's got um, lesson plans all the way from reception up to sixth form, so up to 18 years of age. You can get your students on it. You can sign up as, as teachers and start playing it too. It starts with really basic instructions like move the, move the mouse to the left, move the mouse to the right, now climb three steps, now go down three steps, now go around the circle. So it talks about repetition and loops and variables. Some of this will make a lot of sense to the computing teachers and some a little bit more not. But this is another free um, tool you could use. So from a student perspective, that's the computing program. But it doesn't end there. Digital literacy is not computing only. It's not programming. And I really worry about this because when I was here in the summer, I spoke to a st few students who were in university. And they seemed to think that we really want to do computing, we enjoy it, but we have to stop at programming and we don't enjoy that. So what I try to say to them is there's so much more you could look at. You don't have to only do that. So in terms of communication, collaboration, and creativity, there's multimedia, for instance. And in this area, Within this section, they look, we introduce our children to the following themes. I'm going to read this because I can't see it. We, look at, we introduce them to, uh, from the basic three years of age, the computer, the parts of a computer, a tablet, how to use it. We introduce them to um, the, the digital tools, and then place a big focus on e-safety. I cannot tell you how important online safety and e-safety is at present. How many of you... Um, use WhatsApp. I'm sure everybody does. Okay. How many of you are using Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram? Okay. So these are the channels where a lot of children are sitting. And they're not necessarily meant for the children at this age group. And we'll come to this in a second. I'll talk to you about age groups. But because they're in this environment, and because they may not necessarily ask your permission, or it's done independently, or because it's the cool thing to do at the moment, that we really need to teach them about what makes them safe online. There are issues like cyberbullying, grooming, sexting, texting, all of these things that actually it's taking place in a child's life. And we are all very aware of it now because we've come on board. But teachers need to be just as aware because the students may not have their parents to go to and will need to come to you for some help. Or as an educator, you might, have, you might pick up on something and say, you know, this child's behavior has changed. Or this child's going very inward. Or the child doesn't look at me in my eye anymore. Something is happening and we have to look into it. And it may not be in the classroom, but it could possibly be online. So we start the children from a very young age. We get them to understand very basic things like you don't want to share personal information online. You don't want to give your name. You don't want to take photos of yourself in your uniform. You don't want to put it on Facebook. These are areas where people are watching. Pedophiles are there looking out for children. We, we teach them how to use email. We introduce, and I say email, um, at the age year five and above. You'll be surprised at how many industries, big companies have come to us and said, our children can't write an email. They don't know how to start with the salutation, dear. They just write straight into the email. They don't use thank you. They use the short form TK or something like that. 
They don't say, you know, they don't, these are big clients we're going to be talking about. So we have to almost retrain them and how to write an email. These things are really important too. It comes naturally to us. We wouldn't think twice about it, but it doesn't come naturally to the children. Not in today's world because they're constantly texting or SMSing and they have a different language there. So we introduce them that. We talk about blogs. We show them how to create websites. We show them how to create wikis. Again, all of this is in the book, really basic free resources. Okay? So from an email, like I said to you, we do email etiquette. We talk to them about rules, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable using your technology in the classroom. Most of the time, all of this is done in an ICT lesson. This is not necessarily done in your classroom. So we say that this program is really good in an ICT lesson if you have the opportunity to do so. In some schools that have impl implemented the program, they were not able to squeeze it into their classroom curriculum. So they introduced it early in the morning or in, as an after school club or as a 20 minute drop in session at different times of the day. Because they couldn't squeeze it in the curriculum because it wasn't part of the whole assessment and standards that you'd have to meet. So this sort of curriculum can come in at, I think I moved a slide, uh, can be inserted wherever you need it to go. Okay, another thing we look at is comic strips. Children, you know, we want to make them motivated to do their own work. So it's very well us telling them, okay, now I want you to create a poster. That's fun in the year one, maybe reception years when they can color and paint and use crayon. But as they get older, they want to get more hands-on with the tech. And then that's when we use different tools such as um, explain everything or we use a whiteboard tool which is free again on the smartphone. But another thing that's really interesting is comic light. They love their comics. So they can create comics on their own and they can write their own wordings. So what we tell, to tell them to do is, okay, research a topic. Your topic might be gaming online, what's acceptable gaming, what's not acceptable gaming, and now create your comic strip, for instance. And then when you're done, I want you to now present it to the whole class. Who was, somebody mentioned yesterday about presentation skills. That's one of the enrichment programs, interventions. This is one way to get your intervention also going, presentation skills. Um, okay, so I want to play this video because this is something that our students did. They were, uh, we had a Marks and Spencer's advert being prepared, and so they, they decided they put things together. Oh, I don't know what's happening here. And um, they created this on their own with iMovie. <laughs> This is not just a scotch egg, it is an egg from a dragon encased in mint scots leg matured in the mountains. This is not just passion fruit, this is Dane's bogies boiled in a volcano to perfection. This is not just DNF chicken, it is Icelander's thigh with a topping of grated skin. This is blood boiled in a car's engine, just right to drink. This is not just a juicy apple, it is a ball of juicy human wrapped in hairy skin. stop it it's really loud but what I was trying to prove to you show you is that we taught those skills in our ICT lesson it's just iMovie or movie maker on Windows they inserted the images they created the narrative and they put the video together we sent this off to Marks and Spencer's they won for doing it on their own but it's something children can do and they do this on their own all you have to say as a teacher is that we have a competition in place we'd like you to produce it's a presentation of your own, whether it's a movie or a PowerPoint or a poster, and let them come up with their goods. Okay, so then having looking at the book again in greater depth, you look at computer networks and productivity. There's a big strand in our education we, where we say children need to understand what they're using. It's not just about playing with the iPad or, or downloading apps. It's about understanding what does it mean by network protocols. What does it mean that within, what does HTTP stand for? How is it that messages are being transferred from one, from one area to another? How does an email work? So we do things like picking up phones and you know, introducing them that it's made up of a whole string of data in between. So they do understand the crux and the bones of the whole internet as well. But when I say productivity, we also look at animated things like I've showed you. So these are again some tools where we start children from very young creating little storybooks using our, our Story app. Again, another free app where they Im upload images and they add narrative to it. To much more sophisticated apps like Book Creator, which has a light version and free, 
and, and Spark, which is again free. So, and then we make them, to be, from a very theoretical point of view, and I think this is one very, very good at, they still need to understand spreadsheets, they still need to un understand databases, they still need to have a good understanding of what it means to run a shop, for instance, start their own enterprise. What does data mean? So this all has actually been removed out of our curriculum in the UK, but it is now coming back into it. And that's why these digital literacy books stayed very much, because it wasn't just programming, it's also databases, it's also communication, it's also creativity. These are the skills that our industry is looking for. We are looking at the five Cs, the creativity, the communication, the collaboration, the critical thinking, and digital citizenship. So it's not enough to say, yes, we're doing that, then they've got it, and PowerPoint is the answer. It's not. Okay, I'll come back. at MIT Media Lab. That's enough. We have a dream that... Okay, thank you. So this is Makey Makey. If you haven't heard what it is, you need to bring it into your schools. You can get it on Amazon. I don't know the cost, but there is a cost associated to it. But this is where the children uh, are coding and recoding using different materials. So it's not just a keyboard, it's not just a mouse, but maybe you can do it with, like you saw, through Play-Doh or the piano or through water. But this is taking the child out of the box into a creative environment and say, Recode and have fun with it. I've shown you the basics, now have fun. So it's getting them to think like this. That's really important. Um, I, before we go to the next slide, there was something I wanted to show you. Yeah, another thing that's really important in all of this is entrepreneurship. And that's another thing we encourage as they get from year six, year seven onwards. We get them to think of their own things that they could possibly do with their partners and, and, and in a group. So it'd be anything from creating an online journal to maybe coming up with a new chocolate and, and advertising and how they would advertise that maybe in social media, um, to virtual gyms, to student radios. And if they can't make it, then we tell them put a presentation. But otherwise, look at entrepreneurship as well. So now I'll go through this quite quickly because I don't want to um, continue too much about the books. Um, but in here, we get them to go electronic, hands-on, DIY, and make you make you as you saw. So while it's really important to build a vision, like I said in your school, it is also very important to introduce the right skills for your students. You don't want them to just be reading a book. You don't want just theory. You really need them to get hands-on. And hands-on doesn't mean just programming and C++ and Visual Basic but it's learning other tools kits so that they can go be, become more open-minded. It's being, looking at creativity, it's looking at collaboration in a space other than WhatsApp, maybe Skype, maybe Bayboard, BAI board app, which is again free, where they can all work in the same space. Okay, so while you've got your vision in place, you have your students now done, what's next? The teachers. The teachers are so key, because if the teachers don't know what they're doing, how are you gonna get this going? So there's a lot of implementation that goes on here. Again, now from a teacher point of view, when you're teaching in the classroom, it's all very well having those tools like I showed to you now, but you need to have tools at your fingertips that are in your school. 
I was having a conversation again with some of some people yesterday, and we talk a lot about Office uh, 365 applications, PowerPoint, Microsoft, Excel, Spreadsheet. So some of you may know that Office 365 now is in the cloud, and it has a whole bunch of new applications that work really well in the classroom. And before you implement anything in a school, I always say, think about it pedagogically. Why are you doing what you're doing? So from a teacher perspective, are my students learning with the technology I'm putting in front of them? Can I use this technology to be more effective? And can I be more efficient by using this technology? So the first thing in any school is think about your digital ecosystem. Now this may apply to not just the IT managers, but also to the teachers. So when I go to some schools, they are very interested in the Apple technology because that's the ecosystem. Over here, in my school, it's Office 365 plus Apple, so we've got a hybrid system going on there. It might be here that your tools are more Office-based. It might be Microsoft and Word and PowerPoint, and that's absolutely fine. And you can use that in the classroom, but you can do much more. In the Office 365 platform, you can do a lot more collaboration online. And this is really key because that's how they are all working in industry now. They're working on collaborating through one document rather than through many, many documents and learning to just save. So the one thing I teach all our teachers is you need to understand the technology first. No matter what happens in your school, you have to understand how to use it from a technical point of view. Know where to put it on, know where to put it off. Know, understand the tools with it. Because if you don't get the technology down, then you won't, if you don't understand how to play with the tool, you don't really know how to use it. And the next thing is, why are we doing what we're doing? So most of the time we introduce it with, I'll come back to that one sec, this one, the teaching into pedagogy. At the end of the day, we want to use the technology to support us. We want it to help us in maybe improving our feedback, marking, and assessment. Technology can automatically mark some of your questions. As long as they're multiple choice questions, you can easily get that done. Tools such as Socrative or Kahoot, uh, they can do that for you automatically. Of course, essay-based essay questions is something completely different. But you want to use the technology and, uh, and weave it into your pedagogy. The other thing you want to look at is um, significant feedback or real life feedback makes a big difference. I can't remember who I was speaking to yesterday was saying to me, I just want feedback instantaneously. And that's so doable now. It's so easy to do that. You can have virtual classrooms like Shobi, or if you have Office 365, you can do it on OneNote and OneNote class notebook. So we found that feedback makes a huge marked difference for students who receive it in live environments, can think about it and respond back again quickly, rather than waiting one week later and forgetting what it's all about. So whenever you use your technology for teachers, get it into your pedagogy. Why are you using it? Are you using it to deliver your information in the classroom, maybe from a PowerPoint perspective? Maybe there's other things you can do. Are you doing it for feedback purposes? Are we looking at to mark and assess? Or are we doing it to enrich our lessons and enliven it? So much I heard yesterday was playful learning. We need to bring playful learning back into our environments. We need to look at it. Um, we want the children to, to own their own work, to take, to take ownership of their journey. And by doing this, even though you think you might be integrating the technology into your lessons, you're actually handing it over to the students to continue their learning. Okay, so we use the SAMA model. It stands, if you don't know what it is, it's Rubin's SAMA model. It's called, it um, stands for Substitution, Augmentation, Modification, Redefinition. It's not a quiz, don't worry. What I want to tell you in here is, when we say SAMA, we, we often refer to it as the um, technology pedagogic model. Mm, there's, many times we think of using technology just to substitute our work. So we'll say, oh, why, instead of writing it, why didn't you type it? that's not really transforming the use of your, your, your lesson. So we want you to go further. The next step might be augmentation. You know what, let's introduce an app, for instance, and times tables. I want you to learn your times table really quickly, so I'm gonna introduce a times table app. Okay, that's augmentation. Then we look at modification. Now that you're able to do your, your, your times tables very quickly, I want you to create Quizlet, online Quizlet cards, which is free again. And then create it for each other and start testing each other online. So instead of gaming at home or watching YouTube and Netflix, why didn't you use Quizlet at home? And then we have R, which is redefinition. Use the technology to make big changes, not just process or write an essay on a computer and print it out and then stick it in a book. 
That's not really transforming the classroom. So here are some, so this, we tend to follow the SAMA model. There's nothing wrong with starting at substitution level. But if you've done that, move to the next level. So for example, an, uh, one example might be an, uh, learning the times table, like I said to you. So you, from a substitute point of view, you might use a worksheet and get the students to, to fill up their answers on a worksheet in classroom. Okay, that could work. As you take it further using technology, you might want to use Kahoot, which is again another online free fun app, which you really want to get into your classroom. And you can get the children to play against each other. Now you know when children play against each other, they are very, very motivated. And they're competitive and they want to win. And I promise you, anybody who uses Kahoot now or with their classroom will have laughing children. And then you'll get them re re-energized. So that's taking it into an augmentation level. Yes. Yes, so we trained, I trained uh, one, one, I can't remember, a couple of months ago. CIS, CIS teachers, I, we trained them a couple of months ago, and we int I introduced Kahoot. And I think you had a lot of fun using them. And I think you've taken it into your classroom. So there's a lot of joy when you use Kahoot. Um, and then really you want to get it to a redefinition level, like I said to you, get the children to create their own flashcards, Quizlet, and test each other. And I can tell you now, when a child creates their own work, it's going to be 150 times good. Because to us, they'll give a good, okay, good enough job. It'll get me a B. But you show that to your, your friend, you want it to be beautiful, the best poster, the best movie, the best YouTube. Because that's their face on, on a digital platform. So, it's a really, so when you get them to do their own stuff, they will do it really well. Okay, so that's one example. I won't take you to the second one, but this is another senior example. When you look at a handwritten essay and word process it, and then you take it into a SharePoint or OneDrive environment where all the children are working together at the same time. Here are some other ideas when you want to get started with technology. Um, a starter kit might include looking at the online weather with the children in the classroom. It doesn't have to just stop at um, today is a sunny day, for instance. Everybody, let's remove your iPads. Let's talk about the online weather. Let's look at it in more depth. You might want to look at um, your own Twitter account. This is maybe taking it a bit too far, but it depends on your school and their policies and whether they're happy for you to take it further. Some more intermediate examples, like I said to you, is Kahoot. Another one is start a blog. So one of the things that when we start um, in industry, when they start university level, when they start recruiting for new students, one of the questions they tend to ask is, do you have your own blog? In fact, they ask us that. Do you have your own website? Do you have your own blog? What's your Twitter handle? What's your LinkedIn account? So often we tell the students, if you like to write, you don't have to only use a journal. If you want to do that, that's absolutely fine. Fine. Start your own blog. Get it up there. You might like to write about horses. You might want to talk about all your, your passion for horses and what you like about it, what you don't like about it, the different breeds. And if you can put that up there and then refer to it in your application forms, that makes you a very, very strong candidate because not many people are doing it. So that's another idea. Or you might want to do this in your classrooms. We did Macbeth, and we found that boys don't like to read. But when they became blog police inspectors, for instance, they were watching each other's language, making sure that there was no naughtiness on the channel. They were reading, and they were commenting, and they were blogging, and they were reading one chapter ahead of their time. So blogging is a really powerful tool. And some more advanced ideas, like I said, is start an iPad band. We haven't done it, but I've seen it in action, and it's so much fun. If you have students who like music, you just download GarageBand, for instance, and then they can play with the instruments. And even people who don't know how to play an instrument can make music. So that's another really interesting project to take on. OK, so this is what we use in my school, in Ashford School. We, I build a toolkit of tools that we think work really well. We, like I said to you, we, have, uh, we use Apple with the younger children. We use iPads because they're such good, simple user interface devices. But as the children get older in the senior years, we use Office 365 because we found that the tools they need are more formalized. They need to write longer essays. They need to have PowerPoint at the fingertips. They need to, uh, they need to crunch data on spreadsheets. So as the children are getting older, we found Office 365 is a more valuable tool. But along with that, we have this tools. And as long as you teach the teachers the basics, so make sure you all know the same tools and you're not speaking a different language and the students know it, then you can get the journey going. Whatever you add after this will be up to you. Um, I was going to play a game with you, but I don't think we have time for that. But this is Kahoot. You can have often have a look at it later on if you want. 
Okay, so more cake, less icing. Um, while it's all very well bringing technology into school environment, into pedagogy, into students, you don't want to go too crazy either. It's all, it's all, it's really good idea. There's a lot of technology out there in, in conferences, in exhibitions, and now the market is flooded with ed tech. So make sure you just buy, um, make sure you buy the things you need. Less is more. You, you, you can easily get carried away with, you know, let's use this app and let's use that app and let's do this and let's do that and look at that system. But you need to think about streamlining it, make it simple, make it effective. Less is more, more cake, more substance, less fatty bit. Okay, so then once you've actually implemented the digital literacy curriculum from a more uh, foundational level, the teachers have come on board, which is a, it's about a, a few programs, then you can start running away with things like virtual reality, where you can start doing projects in your classroom, or augmented reality. There's this one teacher I've met who has created his own phonics cards. And um, when you take out a phonics card, there's this code on it, a QR code. When you scan it, up comes a holographic, uh, holographic image. And he hasn't used his voice yet, but you'll have letters. So you might have a uh, CAT cat, for instance. Yesterday when I was watching, listening to Global Stream, I thought that would be really beneficial if you could create your own AR cards and have it come up, but instead of reading it only, also listen to what it's meant to sound like. You know, a cat, a cat so the child knows. So you can do all these good things, and they're not expensive. It's low cost, actually, and, but really effective. Something the child can even take home. You don't even need Wi-Fi. You just need a phone. Which phone comes in with an inbuilt scanner, QR reader, and there you go. It's right there in front of you. So there are a lot of good things. Another really good thing I've seen is on Amazon, there's a T-shirt of a skeleton and a QR code. When you scan it, the whole body comes to life, and you can see all the bones and the structure and the words next to it. So a lot of these children in, in the biology department in one school were wearing this T-shirt and walking around, and they were quizzing themselves, different T-shirts, different subject areas, and they were quizzing themselves before the test. Obviously, you can't wear it on the test day, but they wore that, and they were helping themselves out. So there's all these different tools you can use. One of the things we're looking at is maybe robots. I've been playing around with artificial intelligence and robots, and I want to really see what it feels like. Many of our neighboring schools have already brought in robots into the classroom, not because um, we might be using them to teach, not, not at all, not to replace the teacher, but just to understand what could there be, what would their use be in a classroom. We've thought about maybe them printing out just badges for us, um, for our visitors. Some of them have thought maybe they might be good to pick up litter around the school. Um, in China, they're using it as a, as a means to awaken the child. So they're scanning a child's engagement, uh, facial recognition, and see that you know, when a child is engaged and happy, this is what the child looks like. As soon as we start going droopy and sleepy, then the robot will come up to the child and go, wake up wake up, it's time to do something else. Maybe we should do that in all our conferences as well. But yeah, so that's how, some of the, how they're looking to use some of these robots. And then I said VR, AR. Okay, so that's from a vision point of view, and we've looked at it from a student's digital literacy point of view, and the staff, how important it is to integrate into pedagogy, and now we'll talk about it from a parent's point of view. This is the digital parenting book. I have a few copies, five copies. Um, Dr. Sunita said she's going to send it all to you as an electronic copy so that you could pass it on to your parents. We, we, when I made this with Mike, it was really our intention that we educate as many parents as we can. It's not for profit, but it's there to explain, to, to, to reduce that gap between the parent and the child. Um, because as soon you're going to find out why. So while it's really important to have all that in place, don't forget the parents. Like I said, they go home all the time. You know, anything that is in the world when you're born is normal and ordinary, and it's a natural part of the way you are. Anything that's invented between when you're 13, 15 and 35 years old is new and revolutionary. And anything after you're 35 is against, for you, the natural order of things, but not for your children. So we find it really difficult to understand. And like you said yesterday, what we see is not what our students see. Now imagine that from a parent's point of view. What a parent wants for their child, the child doesn't necessarily want. And if you, as a parent, you'll understand it's actually a really difficult place to be. Okay, so don't forget your parents. You need to tell your parents why you're doing what you're doing, why you're using the technology, how you see making impact in your teaching and the learning of your students, why do you think it's a necessary thing to go forward? 
And I really wanted to look at this further, so I, I did a certificate a, a course in parenting in the digital age. I've got certified for it. And then we wrote that book. Now, that book covers things from gaming, which was Minecraft, but now more recently, Fortnite. If any of you know what Fortnite is? Yeah, isn't it the end of the world? That's all the kids talk about now, Fortnite. So it's understanding why they're gaming, what's the brilliance of it, what's so exciting. And I think it's really important for parents to know that it's not all bad. You know, it's basically a virtual Lego world that you create and recreate and recreate and you never have to break down. So when we have Lego in our rooms, after a while it breaks down, not in an online world, and that's what the kids love. So just as much as we take as much interest in our child's ballet life or, or, or tennis or their gaming or the, the cookery groups or whatever it may be, we have to take just as much interest in their online lives. One, from a safety point of view, but two, because they're really proud of it. And many of us forget, and I'm one of them. I don't want to sit there and watch my child's Fortnite world for one hour. In fact, it's the worst thing to do. But he loves it. So therefore, I must try to understand as a parent, what is it that my child loves so much that I can't seem to understand? And the same with the apps. It is really important to understand the type of apps that your child is going on. So I have here a document, which I'll give to Dr. Sunita. And in here are some really popular apps that our children use. And you'll be surprised to learn that some of them they shouldn't even go on. So for Facebook, we have um, the, the suggested, the, uh, the legal age to join Facebook is 13 plus. We have children who are 10 years on it. And that's really not very good because the type of advertising that they receive on Facebook will only get more explicit as they get older. So we obviously say, you're not really meant to be in it, and we can easily report you and get you off. In fact, it's places you shouldn't be on it. Another one is um, Twitter. 13 plus. Now, while we all know Twitter as a really safe, educational, nice, interested sort of background, it also has its potentially uh, dangerous platforms. There's a lot of uh, what you call uh, the other areas that you don't want your children to be surfing into that. Uh, we have LinkedIn, which is fairly decent app. YouTube is 13 plus. Many children are creating their own videos, but what else are they watching? There was a video here that I wanted to show you, but I didn't want to play it because it's a little bit vulgar, but you'll see two different videos. One looks one of that of a pony. And when you play it, you'll be surprised at the type of language that comes out of that video. And so often I tell parents, you need to vet your videos because you don't know. It might start off with a nice cartoon character. Halfway through, something else will come on. So listen to your videos. Keep it in, a, in, in, a, in an environment, in a living space, something where you can see your child playing with it. Let's see, what else do the children use? There is something called, uh, I should have. Okay, there's something called ask.fm. Again, it's a pretty dangerous sort of environment. I say dangerous because I, I've known a few things in there. Again, it's 13 plus. We have 10 year olds on it. We have the Blue Whale Challenge. Some of you may have heard of it. It's 10 plus. It shouldn't even be, it shouldn't exist, but because it's open platform, it does. But it's a game where you create challenges and in the end, one of the challenges is to go and kill yourself. 10 plus on that. We have the calculator app. Now everybody should know about this. It says 4 plus on it. But the calculator app is the funniest app. So it looks like a calculator, and, but when you double click on it, you'll, have, you'll be able to open it up into a whole new spectrum of apps that the children have downloaded and are hiding it in the calculator app. And we only learn about this because we're educators in our space and because we have the digital technology that's there. But as educators in your space and for parents, it's really important that they are advised about it too. So when you start this whole journey, you need to get the parents on board. And again, we're happy to share this handout with you. But at the same time, you need to be able to tell your parents, this is what we know, and we want you to know too. So we're going to keep you notified about it. The other thing that's in this book you'll find is screen time. Often we say, is it OK if children under two play with screens? We would suggest not. You'll be surprised at how many parents use screen time during dinner time, lunch time, so they can feed them. Okay, so it's very hard to say because the, um, in some of the research we have with the American pediatrics firms basically say children under two should not be using any screen. There are other things for them to do. They can develop their sensory and motor skills. However, we now live in a globalized world. So if their grandparents are in a different place or you've got aunties and uncles in a different country and you're using it to Skype with your child, 
then you as a parent know that that's not detrimental to your child. It's acceptable. If, however, you're using it as a babysitter and it's just sitting there in the, in the side of a room playing with games the whole day, then we know that's not the best thing for our child either. So often we tell our parents, we really would encourage you not to use it, but you know best and you'll know when is the right way not to, not to, when not to use it. The other thing we say is, uh, some of our parents say to us, we can't just get our children off the gaming environment. The blue light, um, they just can't, when they game, they game a lot. Um, so what I tend to say to them is the screen time. If your children are going to be playing a game, you don't want them to play up till dinner and before bedtime. Blue light tends to keep us awake that comes from a phone. So you want to avoid that because you want them to go to sleep and you don't want them to sit there and cry and moan, for instance. Okay, so this is, yeah, sorry, this is the YouTube I was talking about. The one on the left is the anthem, which is the safe one. And the one on the right, although it looks like a cartoon character, actually has quite a bit of um, vulgar words into it. Okay, so the other thing we mentioned to our parents is parenting. And how much how many of us here love Facebook? We love to take photos of our children and put it up online. What we say to them is you don't really want to do that because you're sharing photos of your children of themselves and you could put them in, in danger because you don't know who's looking at it and you're offering information about the uniform, where you can find the school, um, that you've sent a child off to school and now you're going to work. So there's a lot of information you can actually pick up on Facebook. One of the other things we found is that we are encouraging parents not to put up too many um, baby photos of the children either. So we have found that some parents put up photos of children in the bathtub, then playing around as they get older, then when they're five years old they fell off the bike, then ten years old when they were running through, the, uh, through their friend's house in their 90s or whatever it may be. Unfortunately, it's building a profile for your child online. Whether you like it or not, that's, that's just data. This is what our world, no data ever gets lost. So if you were to eventually, as a in, um, cyber recruitment, that's what we call it, an investment. I can't remember the name. I think it's cyber investigations. If you want to find out something about somebody, you just have to put, them that, put down their name, and you can get the entire profile. So we're trying to tell children, uh, parents, don't upload too many photos of your children, because basically you're creating a footprint for them. And what we always say is we need you to have a digital footprint. Um, if your child is going to have a digital footprint, make sure it's positive. We've had a few rejections. I've known of universities that have not taken very um, intelligent students, like highly academically driven, good grades, etc. Because when they Googled them, they found out that they had very um, explicit photos of themselves and bad language online in, in Instagram and in their Snapchat feeds, etc. So that can also be held back against a child. Often we say, keep a digital footprint. Don't put anything on there that you don't want your grandmother to see. Um, if you're not happy about it, if you think a year later I'm going to be quite dismissed by all of it, don't put it up there. Uh, again, with Mike, a year or two years ago, I don't know when we did this, a while ago, we did a survey on... Um, we do it on basically uh, parental engagement with the screen and very much about how do children feel about um, using the technology and I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember what it was about something like that right along the lines of uh, their thoughts the perceptions about the parents using the technology and one of the things we found out was that it's very interesting that we as parents are their role models and some of the stats let me read it to you over a third, 36% of children, people's children say that they have asked their parents to stop checking their mobile device phones. Almost half of them, 46%, say it makes no difference when they ask their parents to stop checking their phones. However, under 10% of parents thought their time spent on devices was concerning. So many, many children are basically asking their parents to stop going on their phone, but we don't often listen. And I say we because I'm also one of them. We don't listen enough. They would like us to maybe get off the phone more. 22% of students felt that the use of mobile devices stopped their families from enjoying each other's company. And 82% of children say meal times should be device free. We have a rule in my house that there is no device on our dining table when we eat food. We have set that expectation. Yet there are many families with parents and children out there who feel that devices are a problem and it's also brought to their, meal to their tables during dinner time or lunch time. So we as parents need to set those expectations. It's no good us saying, don't go on your phone if we're doing that ourselves.
So before we go to bed, I often say to the kids, no phone an hour before bed. But I'm no better because I will check my emails before I go to bed just to make sure I'll catch up the night before I go to school. So I'm actually not setting a very good example. So we have found through the survey that us as parents are their role models, whether we like it or not. And we need to produce, model the same behaviors that we want to see in our children. And our children are crying out for it, but we don't necessarily see it. Right, so this is the book. Happy to show it to you. You're all going to get an electronic copy. I really would encourage you to send it to your parents. We, have, we would be more than happy for you to send as much as you want. Um, and it's really there to, to reduce that, that, that big bridge between the parents and the students. Okay, I won't go through all of this, but let's see. It's very basic. Some of you might be able to help me with this. So I've got five copies. Who can tell me what LOL is? It's very basic, yes. Correct, right. This is your copy, by the way. Okay, I'll give it to you later. Um, so I'll come back to this in a second. These are internet acronyms. Our students, our children, and good for them, have created their own language. And when I made this a year ago, there was a few. I'm sure there's more now. Okay, They've made their own language. And sometimes some of the words are a lot of fun. We use it too. So what's G to G? Yeah, good to go. Right, so that's yours. Perfect. So these are easy ones we use. What's MRF? No? Male or female? Okay. What's PAW? Parents are watching. It gets a little bit more exciting. Um, I think I will not say any more. MOS? Mum over shoulder. So we're chatting, we're having a very indecent conversation. Stop now, MOS, mom over shoulder. 99, I'm coming over. L86, you can find out for yourself. And more, and more, and more. Well, I didn't know any of this when I was writing this book. And in fact, someone said to me, have you looked at the acronyms? At which point, I was very well educated. I was like, wow, even I didn't know this existed. But it exists. 44 um, other drugs, some sort of drugs. So we need to be careful. Oh, and if, if we're never going to know all of it, but we can become aware, and that's really key. At least have an understanding that this sort of stuff exists. We can let the parents know. So if they're walking by and they see code language on their kids' screens, you know it's something you have to be aware of. If your child is constantly hiding their screen away from you or putting it away, or won't even let you look at their devices, for instance, just from far, you know they're hiding something. And that's when I'd say, get the alarm bells out. Have open conversations. You can never sit there and snoop, and it's probably better if you don't, because the stuff you'll see will probably shock you, as it did me, as it would do anybody. But we can only ask them to try, you know, have an understanding, be aware of what they're doing. And then there's more, which you can see later on. I also put together a little proposal. I found that when my children were small, if I didn't set the expectations soon enough, I was constantly moaning. They were getting frustrated. I was taking away the devices that it's too much now, you need to stop, et cetera, et cetera. So together, mom and children, sat, parents and children sat down and we put together a proposal. Monday to Thursday, there'll be no screen. Friday, you can have a bit of screen. Saturday, you can have a bit of screen. Sunday, again, no. That includes gaming and you've got to use age-appropriate apps. You should let me get onto your phones if I need to at any time. You're still very young no personal information, etc. We found that by putting this into place, we were setting the benchmark for our children. So there was less fighting. Some people have really liked it. Some have said it's never going to work. And I agree it will not work with senior school kids. The day you give a phone to the child, forget about it. It's not going to work. Okay? Because they've got 3G, 4G, that's their life. And from then on, hopefully you've set a good, you've given them a good education beforehand to get them to understand what the world, online world is like. But if you don't set the expectations from so early on, then it's going to be very difficult. There'll be a lot more fights and arguments. At least that's what we've seen. So I can't read this from you. Parent-child scenario. Okay, let me put this scenario to you. In the book also, we have some, uh, some scenarios where parents are faced with these problems and they don't know what to do. So we've offered them some sort of strategy and roadmap with it. So one scenario is this. Your son or daughter tells you about their new internet friend called Buddy. Your child has never met Buddy before but they chat on the internet all the time. Buddy has asked your child if he or she would like to chat using video the next time they speak. 
what would you say to your son or daughter? Any answers? My response? No way. But that's not going to work. So what would your response be? Okay, let me help you with this one. So the advice we've said is your children are still very young. They're very naive. And while we want them to become social creatures, it's very important still to protect them. You wouldn't let your child go to the playground with a stranger you don't know. Therefore, you don't really want them to talk to people you don't know either. Just because this person is called Buddy and maybe six years old or eight years old, doesn't mean that that person may not be 44 years old. So it is important to set rules for your children before they start using the internet. One of the things I would strongly um, suggest is it's really important that young children don't meet people from th that they don't know. So one of the things I say to the children is, how can you have 500 or 1,000 online friends? Do you really meet each and every one of them online in the real world? If you don't know that person, you really shouldn't be. I know it's a social world and we're getting to know each other, and that's fine. But you shouldn't be spilling your whole life out of them. Neither should you be really going and meeting them alone. And especially for young children, you don't really want them on a video with a person you've never met. So that's some of the things you put forward. Um, and then I won't, I won't give you the advice, but some other scenarios could be, you know, your child is in an intimate relationship with a boyfriend or girlfriend. They're now gone on holiday. They want to send photos to each other. What would you do? So, you know, so these are the things that happen. And sometimes some parents, children talk to their parents about this, and parents don't really know how to respond. So, again, there's, there's some advice in the book and which they can take forward. Um, okay, if, you, if you'd want the book in real copy, you can go on Amazon. I'm giving you the link or the QR code. But, like I said, you're going to get an electronic copy by Dr. Sunita. So I'm going to end on this one. I think I've spoken enough anyway. But from a digital point of view, in the 21st century, schools should see it as their job to develop really strong personalities for parents, for students, for teachers, and it also extends out to parents. And that, in a nutshell, is your entire digital strategies for mental well-being and happiness in your school. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. You want this? You can stand over here, yeah. I must really thank you for the way you have put the presentation through, the way it was uh, structured. Most of the questions I had, they were answered right throughout the presentation, like about parenting, and then that came, it was answered, and then the next one, and the next one. One thing that's still uh, lingering around is, uh, I've, I've introduced the scratch games uh, earlier, and uh, for two years or so, uh, the students of my school, uh, they were getting uh, prizes at the national level. It's a company called the CSC, it's a uh, computer comp software company which organizes these events. However, uh, I, I gave liberty uh, to the resident students. There are some residential students as well to use laptops because they were re doing really good and they were making games before yes, the, and yeah. all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then within a week, we saw change in their behavior and all that stuff. Uh, we, we are very, very particular about watching and you know observing them and all that stuff. And uh, we have this old school headmaster who looks into, uh, looks into, you know, as a warden over there. Hmm. But then he could not understand what was actually happening. He was just thinking that using computer to see the games. However, you know what would have happened, you know, where they got distracted and how they started changing. These are young adults. Mm -hmm. That caused a lot of concern and they immediately stopped the computers and then all that stuff. But then that was a loss because they could not participate in the games and all that stuff. Sure. So, of course, that, that was not the right approach to solve it as well. Is there some kind of technology, some app, some software that controls uh, the usage uh, or that limits the, the screen or the access or something? Yes, actually there is. Um, but there's two things I wanted to say here. From a school point of view, we have borders in our school, which means that we have some students staying in our environment. So our Wi-Fi line is very filtered. 
We don't allow for any social media. We've given our children devices, but there's no social media allowed. We're not allowed in, to um, download anything like that. And after a certain time, then some of our students are allowed particular apps. Mm -hmm. But that's one way to stop a lot of that. If, however, they're using their phones, that's a different thing. From a reduction of usage of apps, in iOS, they've recently introduced, um, it's called Parent App, I think. I'm not sure what it's called exactly. But you can see how what apps you're using and for how long you're using. There are also other tools. There's something called OT, O-O-Y-T-Y. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can download that on a device, and then you can monitor as a parent. But that doesn't mean the child will not remove that app. It's, you can't lock down. Mm -hmm. But in your Wi-Fi filters and your service pro providers, you can set parental control and permissions. In our, we can also, what we've done in my home is we have three different Wi-Fi lines. So if this is something you're doing with your children in school, you might want to have one dedicated to your school, one dedicated to your, t to your teachers, so they have open access, but also one dedicated to your students with limited access. And it's really key, but as they get older, we have to we open it up more, because it's time that they understand that this is their world, and so we're preparing them for it slowly rather than just giving them full free reign. Does that help? Uh, yes, it does, uh, to an extent. I was still thinking about how I would do it at home, but, but let, let me work out with that, uh, call putting filters. In their home or your yeah, In their, their homes their as well. home, you can't do anything. That's from their parents. So you'll have to talk to the parents and say, ha, let's put some parental control, parental permissions. Right. But that all service pro providers are doing now. They have to do it. Right. So you just need to call up. For over there, we have Sky or we have BT. And we call them up and we say, we want to set parental controls. Mm -hmm. And then that's how we do it. We block certain sites. That must be developed here in India as well. Yeah, I'm sure and you should be able to get that. Yeah. And one last thing, your course, what you're talking about, it's yeah. so very interesting. Do you have a, a webinar or an online course?